1,000 meters ahead. What they do is they prepare the battlefield first with artillery, those multiple rocket launchers that we've seen over the last couple days. They prepare their path with those rocket launchers. The tanks move forward. If they get in a uh, incoming fire, the rocket launchers and the artillery fire up again, and they call in air support. It's speed, maneuver, speed, maneuver, until you overwhelm the enemy with, from all sides. And that's how they are fighting this war from the very first hour. And uh, that, those, are, those will be the units that go into Kuwait. The units that go into Iraq, we suspect, left some six to seven hours ago from their positions more than 100 miles in the western desert and cut way into Iraq to come down on behind the Republican Guards divisions in southern Iraq. Those units won't see any fighting for quite some time, and, uh, but they again will overwhelm the Republican Guards units once they get there. And uh, it's called a massive turning move, as Mr. Dunnigan uh, explained to us. And it's the kind of thing, uh, Garrick, that uh, they have practiced, literally practiced these things for six months. Well, Garrick. Fred, you mentioned uh, the importance of air power. It is nighttime. Some of the Apache helicopters can operate at night. But can the fighter bombers get in there and really attack at night, too? Oh, yes. Uh, the, the A-10, uh, the Warthog, the, probably the ugliest and oldest machine in the air, uh, has a night fighting capability. Its missiles, the, the missiles that it carries, uh, light up the targets at night with infrared. Uh, a target cannot be missed. It gets locked on to uh, the Apache helicopter with its Hellfire missiles. Again, infrared. They see the targets. They lock on to them. Uh, the F-15E, uh, uh, the Air Force's ground attack version uh, of its fighter, uh, again has a system that sees the battlefield as if it were daytime, locks onto targets, fires its missiles, as well as the F-16. So there are a variety, uh, and including the Navy, has an A-10 attack aircraft. All of these aircraft, all at once, will be hitting the battlefield in front of the American forces. And then if uh, there is incoming fire from the Iraqi positions, the, the U.S. tank units will maneuver, get away from the incoming fire, call in the air power again. That is why, Garrick, they call it the air-land battle doctrine, and it's fought in that kind of an energy with air, ground, air, ground, speed and maneuver. It just overwhelm the enemy and come from behind. All right, Fred Francis, and that battle is being fought at this moment, not that many miles from, from where Tom Brokaw is standing by in Dahran, Saudi Arabia. Tom, I believe you have a question for Fred. Yeah, Fred, I was just wondering about whether these oil fires are going to have much of an impact on the close air support because some of the pilots that I've talked to over here have talked about the need to get down beneath the smoke. They really have to plunge down through a very heavy and even toxic cloud of smoke that's hovering over Kuwait. Are they worried that that will have much of an impact on close air support? No, not where the oil fires are now, Tom. The oil fires are covering uh, the, the, uh, the southeastern the quarter, yeah. the southeastern corner of Kuwait, where the weakest troops happen to be. And those are where the helicopter assault teams will go in under, under that cloud. So you can see the fires there, and uh, th that's no problem for helicopter pilots. It is a problem for the smart bombs, because the laser beam from the smart bombs cannot go through that smoke. But for, for helicopter operations and for A-10 warthogs to attack ground, pro, uh, ground targets, it's not much of a problem. And Tom, especially where that smoke is in southeastern Kuwait, uh, where the weakest Iraqi troops are, uh, they're not going to need as much air cover because the initial port reports that we are getting is they are surrendering in, mass, in, in large numbers. Uh, Fred Francis, uh, we've been talking about the technology, the weapons of war. Of course, at the center of all of these weapon systems are American and allied soldiers. They're the men who now, even at this hour in the middle of the night, are, are advancing deeper and deeper into Kuwait. They may have to fight for up to 24 hours, maybe even longer without sleep. Sure. How do you treat the human equation here, the human element? Well, first of all, in combat, uh, as... Uh, <laughs> As many of us know, adrenaline takes care of the first 24 hours. Uh, the combat that I have seen, you don't really think about sleep, but there comes a point uh, when, the, when you back off and the, you lose the adrenaline. And I will tell you just frankly, covering the combat in Panama last year, uh, one uh, ranger colonel came up to me and, he, and uh, he started babbling almost incoherently in the fourth, I guess it was the third day, and then he caught himself and he apologized and he said, I apologize, that was the chemicals talking. So some of your commanders will be taking amphetamines as this goes on, Garrick. All right, Fred Francis at the Pentagon, thank you. Stand by there. And let's go back to Tom Brokaw in Saudi Arabia. Tom. Uh, thank you, Garrick Outlay. And Fred Francis, it's also worth pointing out that some of these colonels even, as well as majors, are going into combat for the first time. It has been that long since Vietnam that they have risen through the ranks. Let's go now to the White House and NBC's John Cochran, who is standing by there. And I gather, John, that we're anticipating the return of President Bush from Camp David. 
That's right, Tom. That would be approximately 40 minutes from now, and we would expect the president to address the nation sometime after that. I was talking to an official here who said he would expect that the president, in explaining why we're moving so quickly, would also talk about the latest reports of atrocities within Kuwait, particularly within Kuwait City. However, this official also cautioned me. He said most of our information comes from what is being called the Kuwaiti uh, resistance. It is very difficult for the United States to uh, verify these reports, so the president would have to be somewhat careful. Uh, we, we cannot verify these through what uh, the Pentagon and uh, the CIA call national technical means, and Fred Francis can talk about that. Freddie, you can uh, uh, jump in on that, but national technical means to some degree means the, uh, the satellite photos, the aerial uh, photos. It, you just can't prove atrocities through that. However, these reports seem to have been pretty reliable in the past, and this has really been stepped up in the last week with young men from about the ages of uh, 14 to 45 or so being pulled off the streets. In some cases, uh, according to the Kuwaiti resistance, they've been executed. In other cases, it is believed here at the White House that some of these people would be held as hostages to help during the retreat from Kuwait. Now, I, I don't know how that would work, but that is uh, one theory being advanced here at the White House, that that's one reason for the hostage-taking, Tom. Thank you, John Cochran. Well, Fred Francis, what about that at the Pentagon? And can you describe for us as well stage two and three once the ground war begins in terms of dealing with the Iraqis that they capture and the prisoner of war facilities? You've had some reports on that in the past. Sure. Uh, first, what uh, my colleague John Cochran was talking about, the reports they're getting from inside Kuwait City, some of them are coming from Kuwaiti resistance, but some, I will tell you, are coming from uh, something that the United States has not had from a long time, and that is human sources actually working for the U.S. government and reporting back from inside Kuwait City. And uh, what they are reporting is, as John said, uh, a rounding up of young men uh, all over Kuwait City, and I think they would be used as shields. And that gets us to the next level, Tom. The next level, if they're using it as shields to escape, they're not going to be able to do that because stage two of all this is that there will be no escape for Iraqi troops. The whole plan is centered around, and as of, you'll remember those words, Tom, where Colin Powell says we're going to cut them off and we're going to kill them. Well, the cut them off is the operable word right now because they're going to literally seal off Kuwait so that the Iraqis cannot withdraw. And uh, as they, the one fear, Tom, that I have been told at the Pentagon by senior officials here is that they would take so many prisoners in the opening days that that would slow the campaign down. Senior officials told me here that they have worked out a process uh, over several months uh, to handle these prisoners. And one of, the, uh, one of the, the parts of that plan was calling up virtually every National Guard and Reserve police unit in the country to backfill so that American policemen, military policemen, could be there to handle what was expected to be 200,000 Iraqi prisoners. In the Saudi desert, they have built camps for 100,000. So the big concern in the opening days of combat with uh, these opening hours, which we are in now, is how to process those prisoners quickly so it doesn't slow down the battle. Uh, the air-land battle, the American doctrine to fight like this, is predicated on speed, speed, maneuver, and speed. So if you're slowed down by prisoners, then that gives time for the Iraqi soldiers who don't plan to give up to work that artillery. Artillery is the killer here in every war. In every war, Tom, 60% of those who are killed and wounded are killed and wounded by artillery fire. That is why, Tom, that so much time has been taken over this last 37 days to destroy as much of the artillery pieces in the Kuwaiti theater of operations. And they have done that. They have destroyed 48% of 3,000 or 3,100 pieces that the Iraqis had there. That's the key to this battle, Tom. Thank you very much, Fred Francis of the Pentagon. I know that you'll be happy to hear, as we are relieved to report, that we've got an all clear here in Saudi Arabia and throughout Saudi Arabia. We do not know whether there was a Scud attack in fact or whether there has been a successful intercept. We'll get back to you on that when we have additional details. The big battle, of course, is going north of here. We want to talk strategy and tactics now. In New York, NBC's Gary Cutley is standing by with our two consultants, James Dunnigan and retired Army Colonel Harry Summers. Gary? 
Uh, Tom, we're talking about what we think is happening in these opening uh, phases of the ground operation. Uh, gentlemen, uh, we've been told by Fred Francis that American units have now advanced up to 15 kilometers inside of Kuwait. We don't know what is happening in terms of the seaborne elements, that is the U.S. Marine forces. Would they attempt an amphibious landing or a helicopter assault at nighttime? It's difficult enough during the daylight. I, d I doubt whether they try to do it at night. When do you think it might come? Dawn is several hours away. And dawn is usually when you launch an amphibious operation to give you the maximum amount of daylight in which to complete it. So it'll either be in a couple of hours or most likely they wait another 24 hours. Now many people are going to be asking about the importance of Kuwait City right here. That of course is on the coastline. We know we've heard a lot about it. That's where the, the, most of the population is located. But how important is attacking Kuwait City and liberating it militarily? Well, I don't think they're... I can't imagine them attacking Kuwait City. I think what they'll do is come in behind it and try to cut Kuwait City off from the Iraqi uh, reinforcement and all. But I just can't imagine sending troops into the city itself, at least not uh, U.S. troops. But is Kuwait City more important symbolically, uh, Jim Dunnigan, or not? It's important symbolic, but, uh, but as Colonel Summers points out, that's where you can take tremendous casualties with close-in fighting. There is a humanitarian reason for wanting to go into Kuwait City, because apparently the Iraqis are killing uh, civilians in great numbers. But again, it, it ties you down. Remember Stalingrad, and Kuwait City could become that, and you'd be playing at the Saddam's hands. He has a division of some of his most reliable troops in there. Now, we're getting only fragmentary information but one of the, part of that information is that large numbers of prisoners are being taken could that become a problem as Fred Francis indicates or are there ways to handle maybe tens of thousands of prisoners we did that in World War two we just turn, sort of almost turned them loose with a very loose guard and sent them to the rear they're they're surrendering they don't want any part of the war anyway and, and so I think you could do that is just send them to the rear and have people collect them up when they get back there it certainly wouldn't tie down your attacking columns we wouldn't allow ourselves to be tied down with that sort of thing now, there is a battle plan. Each unit commander has that plan. He has to make this work. Where do you think, Jim Dunnigan, is the most risky part of this operation? The most risky part is going to be going through these multiple lines. Uh, the Iraqis learning from the Russians uh, build their defensive uh, positions in, say, three lines or more, depending on where it is. As you get further back, you're going to run into more reliable and perhaps more full of fight Iraqi soldiers. They have the motorized and a couple of armored divisions back here, and the troops might get a little cocky after they've taken several thousand prisoners and penetrated 50 kilometers. That's when it gets the most dangerous. All right, let me raise the question of chemical weapons. We've heard a lot about Iraq's chemical capability, artillery shells, uh, mortars, other kinds of uh, weapons they have which can spread chemical gas. I have heard that some American troops would be going into combat wearing their anti-chemical weapons uniforms. Is that practical? Can a man fight and move with that on? Not for an awful long period of time. I really don't think that we're going to see chemical warfare. You don't? Why? Because our troops are well prepared. Chemical warfare hadn't been used since World War I for a very good reason. It's not a very good weapon of war. So that it's okay against unarmed civilians and unprotected civilians or against unprotected troops. But against protected troops, it's, it's almost militarily insignificant. It's a terror weapon, but it, don't, it doesn't have that great of a military. It's not that great of a killer. Uh, why waste artillery shells with chemical weapons? Put high explosives in them. Uh, James Ennegan, are chemical weapons something the American troops should be careful about or worry about this evening? It is nighttime there. Do the Iraqis know where to fire their artillery shells? The Iraqis do indeed have a big problem with uh, using chemical, uh, you know, artillery with chemical shells. Uh, they could even hit their own people. I agree with Colonel Summers. I think the uh, chemical uh, warfare threat has been much overrated. Primarily because, as, as Colonel Summers points out, we are prepared for it. If it does happen, I don't think it will cause a lot of casualties. All right, let's put ourselves not on the L. This is a KWWL special report, War in the Persian Gulf. Good evening, I'm Tammy Weinsick. As you've been hearing on NBC... All ...those Scud attacks and wanted a, a piece of the action. The U.S. Uh, and the Allies had withheld those codes which allow uh, air forces to identify each other as friendlies, and I guess that's been in the way of a uh, concerted attack uh, by Israel on Iraq. Do you have anything at all tonight on the possibility of them joining in? If anything, we have less, and that's perhaps probably the intriguing part, is that Israel is talking less and less and is keeping very, very uh, close-lipped about that. All we hear now is that Israel will retaliate and Israel will choose the time. But in weeks prior, we were hearing much more about the possibilities, the potentialities, how it might happen. Certain experts were out there guessing publicly. But much of that has closed in and has become very, very quiet, perhaps ominously quiet. 
All right, Greg Lefebvre reporting in Jerusalem. I would like to enter this uh, note of apology on behalf of all of us. Some of what we're reporting in this early stage of the ground war must be uh, to some degree speculation. We hope you'll forgive us. We'll try our best not to uh, deliver anything to you that we don't really know. But uh, if we skirt along on that issue, we hope you